Let's go ahead, if you would, we'll go ahead and get services started this morning. We'll start by singing page 529, page 529, there shall be showers of blessings. And we've got a little showers outside, kind of fits this morning, but we're going to place raindrops with blessings. All right, let's sing it out, page 529, as we sing this morning. There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing. Sent from the Savior of all. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. But for the showers we plead. There shall be showers. Everlasting on. Singing 
be seated. You may be seated here as we go through some of our announcements. Good to have you out this morning, and uh, we just praise the Lord that God has given us a place to come and worship Him, hear uh, His Word, but also just uh, the part of worship that comes by way of fellowship as well. And good to see our church family uh, and just uh, check in on how the week's going with people. So I'm, I'm grateful for a church family and a place that we can call home here at Maranatha. If you have your bullets, and go ahead and pull it out. A couple things that we would like to just take note of. A couple things just want to make a mention of. We had been um, promoting a ladies of craft night. I believe it was coming up uh, this upcoming week, uh, Friday, but we have postponed that. We have postponed the ladies' craft night, so I just wanted to make that mentioned in the bulletin. So thank you uh, for paying attention to that. But then we do have a Vacation Bible School All Hands meeting April 29th at 9 a.m. So if you are going to be working in Vacation Bible School uh, for our children over the summer, we would like you to come out to this meeting kind of get a, a lay of the land and what we're doing and some dates and timelines. And so uh, April 29th, and to be honest, what are we in here? We're in mid-April. I mean, third week of June is when uh, when Vacation Bible School is. So we're, we're, we're approaching that time when things are going to start, you know, uh, becoming more and more evident that Vacation Bible School is on the horizon. And so uh, please make note of that uh, April 29th. And then Sunday night fellowship, we're going to have another one of those on April 30th. So just plan to come out that night after the service. We're going to play some volleyball and do some things like that in the activity building. If you don't play volleyball, we still want you to come out. Just come out and enjoy fellowship and watch me try to hit a ball coming over the net, okay? It would be pretty entertaining. I'm sure of it. Uh, but anyways, that's what's happening in April. Something that I do want to make mention of that's on the back table and uh, for a sign-up sheet, we are going to have a camping trip, a church camping trip, second annual. If you were with us last year, we went to Sycamore Springs up in Mitchell, Indiana. It was a little bit far it was, it was a great campground. It was a great campground, but we're not going that far this year. We are going to stay local. We are going to go to Charlestown State Park, and that way uh, it just is a little bit closer. I love that campground up there. It was very friendly, but uh, we are going to go to Charlestown State Park. There's information, sign-up sheet on the back table uh, of the dates, and that way it's a little closer to home, and uh, you can avail yourself to come and go or camp with us, either one. All right, but there's some information on the dates back there. So the church camp trip, and we're going to pray that no rain happens. Last year, if you went camping with us, it was, it was kind of cold in that miserable rain. It wasn't even like gutter-washing rain. It was just kind of an annoying cold rain, and, and then it started raining, and we got all huddled up under this little pavilion and ate pizza. Uh, it was a struggle to have a smile, but we did. But this year, hopefully, it doesn't rain on us too much. And the good thing, if it does rain on us too much, I'll just go sleep in my own bed, okay? That's how that'll work out. Uh, but uh, so anyways, that's coming up. Church camp trip. Just sign up so we can know how many campsites to reserve. Uh, and, it, you know, yeah, I think it'll be a good time, okay? And so that information is on the back table. Don't forget, on May 28th, West Coast Baptist College singing group is going to be coming through. Um, and so, once again, nobody's contacted me. If you want to open up your home uh, to this group, uh, we'll need uh, two, at least two homes to open up to uh, that they might stay with you in just uh, that night uh, so they have a place to stay. But they're going to come and sing at our church on May 28th, and uh, I think it'll be a blessing to you. They're going to present the college, give us some information about the college as well. But uh, looking forward to that. So plan to be here. Mark that on your calendar. Um, as that group comes through, okay? Anything else this morning? I do have somebody that I'd like to uh, bring up. We got a letter in the mail, Bob and Shelly. Um, I got a letter in the mail from the Jeffersonville Police Department. Now, don't let that scare you, okay? It was a good letter, okay? Um, and I, I was praying about who I could give this to and just run with it. And the Lord put on my heart, Bob and Shelly. And so they have something they'd like to share that they contacted the Jeffersonville Police Department with. And... I'll let them present. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, it says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Uh, this is an opportunity that um, the, Saint, or the uh, Jeffersonville Police Department has asked our church to partner with them. And... Uh, 
Uh, I think that uh, this is a worthy uh, investment in our local police department. Um, Pastor agrees that uh, this is something that uh, is worthwhile and we would like to, uh, the church as a family, Pastor just mentioned today that we're a family. Uh, we're a church family that can uh, partner with the city in being a blessing to the police officers. Uh, in 1962, they officially made uh, uh, a week in May, National Police Officers Week. And uh, so we're going to ask the church if they would uh, help us as, the, uh, as we find ways to be an encouragement to the police officers. Shelly has four ways that which we can contribute. And uh, so Shelly, would you tell them what it is? Okay, so what they asked us to do, which I think is real exciting, is that we do cards of encouragement, notes of encouragement to the police officers. And how many times have you been out there and you wanna say, you see a police officer at a restaurant, and you just wanna go thank them for what they're doing, especially what we've heard in the news lately mm -hmm. too. So um, yeah, we have an opportunity to do cards, notes of encouragement, put in there also about your love for the Lord. Invite them to our church, you know, whatever you can think of. Uh, I have a box in the back that you can put the cards in once you've done that. Now there's about 90 police officers involved, so if you wanna write more than one letter, that'd be great. Um, and then also they said the second thing would be is uh, our children can get involved, or teens, where if they color a picture or do you know artwork, they'll put it up in the police department that week during the week that they're doing it. So it's May 14th through the May 20th, we didn't mention that. but, And then the third thing would be um, they're gonna have a church put together goodie bags for the officer and uh, we, we can go ahead and do like hand sanitizers, Kleenex packages or a bag of candy. I've got a sign up list in the back if you would like to participate in that part as well. And then the last thing, they actually asked us to pray for their officers during that week. Well, we can do that ahead of time as well. So be praying for that, your, card, your cards and encouragement and the you know, message will go forth to them. And that's what we have. To, if you have any questions, you can talk to Bob or I. But. I think the important thing of the, all this is the last one that Shelly said about praying for our officers. And uh, what is, is good to hear in this day and age that the government is asking for our prayers. So uh, we need to step up and uh, be an encouragement to the police department. Yep, thanks. Amen. And so those, that information, uh, the, the, the box will be in the back on the back table. And also we'll get that information in the bulletin as well. So uh, we'll get that over and in the bulletin so you can keep track. 92, is that what you said? 92 officers in, in the Jeffersonville Police Department. And so we want to, we want to uh, try to be a blessing to them. And uh, it, it was interesting because this letter came in the mail about two weeks ago. And as I was kind of figuring out if we were going to get involved, the first thing we did, I said, Bob, check it out. See if it's something that, that we wanted to be a part of, right? So he made a phone call. And after they explained to him, you know, what it was about, he came and said, yeah, I think we do want to be a part of this. And so I said, good. I'm not going to micromanage you. You run with it. You, you, you handle it. And they've done that. And so we'll get that information into the bulletin, but uh, especially in light of what we saw in our community last week, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, something that, that kind of, I think, shook the community uh, pretty good uh, on what, what happened last week and, and just how members of that, that law enforcement rushed in there and not really thinking of their own lives and, uh, and, and unfortunately uh, were injured in, in the process. So we do want to, to, to support uh, this cause. And so... Uh, and if anything, they just know that they have a church, that if something happens in their own lives, hey, this church prayed for me during this week last year, and uh, maybe I'll go over and visit them. So um, we just want to be a blessing. So thank you, Bob and Shelly, for taking this on. If you have any questions, see them, uh, but also we'll get it in the bulletin as well, okay? All right, let's do this. Would you stand with me again? Stand with me again. When we all get to heaven, man, what a day that will be when we all get to heaven what a day that will be, page 571, page 571. Oh, yes, that's what you were saying. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. Thank you. 
heart. And that song ought to strike that same memory uh, in your minds as well. What is it going to be like when we all get to heaven? And I think the writer here tries to paint some pictures. And we can try to paint some pictures in our own mind of what it might be like. But really, I don't think we'll have a, a clue until we reach uh, that side. It'll be so amazing. We're going to do this. If you would sit, uh, be seated. We're going to have the ushers come forward. I, I got some things out of order. Pretty typical. We'll take the offering at this time. Connor Webb, would you please pray? <laughs> Amen. Barnett is turning 99 this week, 99, and so that's a, that's a that's a that's a 99 years. That's a long time, and so we praise the Lord for that. But um, you know, I think we're going to encourage the church to send a card or gather up some cards. Do we, do we want to gather them here and take them all at once, Judy? Okay. So either find out Charlotte or Judy, uh, uh, and we want to try to get. I think we can get 99 cards, 99 cards for a 99th birthday, okay? And so uh, if you would like to take part in that, Lucille Barnett, she's actually one of the shut-ins that's on our prayer list. Um, she's in the directory as well if you have a directory. Uh, but, you know, we're going to put together some cards and, and either take them over there or send them her way. Uh, looking for 99 cards from her church family, okay? And so we'll, we'll take part in that. I want to have one more song, one more song. Would you stand with me, page 478, page 478. We'll sing this song nice and loud and uh, just, uh, just kind of bring in the message with it as well, page 478.
verse. Yeah, second verse, sorry. No Satan should
right, great, thank you for that. Children, if you're in here and you'd like to be dismissed with Mrs. Clifton, you can go ahead and be dismissed at this time. She's going to head downstairs, take them kids, have a good time down there with them. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9 is where we're going to begin our reading. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9. And uh, we're, going to, we're going to tackle this this morning. I pray that it will be an encouragement to you. You ever come to a point in your life where you say, man, I just need some encouragement. I don't care where it comes from. I just need some encouragement. You might, uh, might be going through a trial, a difficulty, uh, something in your life. It just seems that, man... I can sure use somebody, something to pick me up right now. We've all been there. No doubt you've been there. I've been there. I'm going to tell you, when you look at the book of Hebrews, that's what this book is. Remember what the writer is doing. The writer is trying to, to encourage the Jew, these Hebrews to go forward for Christ. No doubt they had been persecuted. No doubt maybe their own family has shunned them for accepting Christ, right? Uh, and so they are on the fence. Do I go forward for Christ? Do I go back to the way it used to be? Do I go back to that old form of Judaism? Do I go back to that old worship? And so the writer here essentially in the book of Hebrews is writing this book to encourage those believers to go forward. I, would be, I think it would be fair to say that these Hebrews needed a pick-me-up. They needed encouragement, and that's what this writer is doing. If you remember the theme, is it's that Jesus is better, right? He's using that theme as an encouragement to the readers here to say, come on, keep going forward, keep pressing forward, keep pressing toward the mark, right? Go forward. Why? Because Jesus is so much better than what you're, what you're leaving behind, that old form of worship. Jesus is better. And so he's writing this as an encouragement. And the verses that we're going to look at today in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9 through 20, that's what we're going to find. We're going to find words of encouragement. And so I would say this. If you're here today and you find yourself in this same position to which the Hebrews found themselves, struggling, struggling to keep pressing on as a believer. Maybe you're here today and you've been uh, experiencing doubts, experiencing doubts about spiritual things or experiencing doubts about the future. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you've been tempted simply just to throw in the towel and give up in following after Christ. If you're here today, you're in the company of the readers here in Hebrews. Maybe you're here and you're just, you, you've been sluggish in response to the trials that have entered into your life. I'm going to tell you this section of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 9 through 20 is for you. This letter is for you. The same help that the writer here offers to his readers is offering of help to you as well. All of us, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, all of us, at some time or another, you're going to find yourself needing a stabilizing anchor. A stabilizing anchor for our souls. We all need reminder of hope, don't we? We all need reminder of the hope that lies for the believer. We all are in need of a reminder of the hope that rests within. In the midst of all of life's troubles, in the midst of all of life's craziness, in the midst of all of the, the failures to which we experience, we need mental pictures to help remind us that it's not all lost. As long as God is alive and in control of the world, which we know He is and forever will be, then we always have hope. And we need to be reminded of that in our lives. Now, we have just experienced, if you were here last uh, two weeks ago, we took a break for, for, for last week, but, but two weeks ago we were looking at warnings to which 
Uh, the writer is given to the, the, the readers here, the, the Hebrews. He was giving warnings to them at the beginning of chapter 6. And now, like any good presenter, any good uh, you know, uh, presenter of the gospel, teacher, uh, you, you give some warnings, but you gotta, you got to give some encouragement along with the warnings. And so he transitions about halfway through this chapter in chapter 6 to give, to go from warnings to encouragement. And he begins in verse 9 by saying this. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9, we'll read, uh, I don't know, to verse 12 to open this up. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. What he's saying is like, look, I've got I've to go on and, and remind you again of the things that you have gotten as a part of your salvation. Look, yes, you have an eternity waiting for you. Let's remember that. There is a hope for you. So here the writer says, look, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. We're going we're to remind you of the things to which are to come. Things that once you've trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, once you believe in God the Father, things that are to come. And here's what he goes on to say, and this is some encouragement to each and every one of us today. He says, let me remind you of some things. Look, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. Look, you haven't been forgotten down there. Yes, you may be experiencing trials. Yes, you may be experiencing persecution as, if the, as these Hebrew, uh, Hebrews were, right? But God has not forgotten about you. Have you ever been at a point in your life where you say, man, I just feel as if God's forgotten about me. And this is what the writer is trying to get across. He's trying to give him encouragement. Look, God is not unrighteous to forget your work. Look, he's not unrighteous to forget your, your, your labor of love. And he goes on to say, look, he's not forgotten. You've showed him that. You have done these things. You have labored uh, out of love for God. And he is not unrighteous to forget it. Look, he knows what you're going through. He sees what you're going through. Which ye have showed to his name and that ye have ministered to the saints. And do minister. What he's saying is, look, you've taken care of his saints. You've taken care of those in the church. You've taken care of, uh, of those that have come through your house. Not only have you taken care of them, but you've gone out of your way to minister. And the writer goes on to say, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Look, he's saying, don't give up. And I want to tell you this morning, Christian, if you're, if you're, on that, if you're in the place to which these Hebrews were, you've got, you're at a point in your life where you're like, man, I just feel like giving, in the, uh, giving up, throwing in the towel. Don't give up. Why? Because there are, there are better things awaiting you. There's a hope that's been promised. But followers of them who through faith and patience do what? Inherit the promises. He's encouraging them not to give up. He's encouraging them to move on to maturity. Not to be sluggish in their faith. Man, be zealous about your faith, not sluggish in your faith. And he reminds them now of the value of faithfulness. He reminds them of, 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 of that value by holding that we're going to read here in just a minute to the example to which Abraham had. And Abraham exp expressed in both patience and in service. Abraham was patient. We're going to look at, most of us remember why he was patient. But, but nonetheless, we looked at his patience, but also Abraham in his service. And he reminds us. That God gives his promise of blessing and his sworn oath to support his word. God is truth. And his word is true. 
things around. We're, we're not familiar with that, though. Why? Because we've been let down so many times throughout our life. It's something that's so, 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 so foreign to us because everything we've looked at, when we look out, all we see is this sin-tarnished world. So we're not familiar with someone that's 100% true. We're not familiar with, with people that don't let us down. We're not familiar with someone who won't hurt me. But here the writer reminds them that there is one that won't let you down. There is one whose word is true. There is one who has given promises and those promises are etched and will never go away. A promise made by a God who cannot lie. That's what he's trying to get across here. God has given you a promise and a God that cannot lie. It ought to bring you comfort and encouragement. Encouragement. A God who cannot lie has given you promises. And in those moments to which you need encouragement, you need to be reminded of this. Encouragement to these struggling believers. If you're one of those here this morning, find encouragement in the character of God. That he absolutely 100% keeps his promises. One of the greatest dangers facing Christians today, I believe, is to lose sight of the basis of our hope. We live in what seems to be a hopeless world. And every time you turn on the news, every time you read an article, every time you get a notification on your phone, it seems as if it's even getting more hopeless. And so the greatest danger I believe a Christian can face this morning is to lose sight of the basis of our hope. Our hope is not found in the world around us. It's found in Christ. And when we become so burdened with the stormy blasts of life, whatever it might be, it might be health, it might be persecution, it might be financial problems, whatever, whatever is blasting away at your life this morning, we cannot forget our hope. And that is Jesus Christ. When we become so burdened with those stormy blasts of life that we forget our hope, we face, when you forget your hope, you face a slippery slope of sluggish doubt and even worse, hardening your heart against the gospel. And so to remedy this, to remedy this, the the writer, to give some encouragement, to give some encouragement to these Hebrews that are experiencing uh, persecution, a doubt, helplessness, to give that encouragement, he reminds them of the promise of God. That's what he does. And this morning I want to share with you a threefold encouragement that we can find in these verses. Some encouragement. We need encouragement. Let's be real. We need encouragement in our life. And where do we go to find it? Far too often we try to find that encouragement in places that are only going to leave us wanting more. But Jesus Christ and His Word is where a person can find true comfort and encouragement. And that's what the writer's going to get across. Hey, remember those promises that you have as a believer. Remember the inheritance that you have as a believer. Number one, we, we, we have profound comfort. We have profound comfort of the, of the person of God. That's what the writer's going to get across here. Look, you can find comfort in the person of God. Go with me to verse 13. Verse 13. For when God made promise to Abraham, when he made promise to Abraham because he could swear no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless thee. And multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained what? The promise. This is a great example for those Hebrews about thinking about giving up. Those Hebrews that are thinking about going back. He says, remember Abraham? How God swore an oath to him on nothing higher than himself. And so after he had patiently endured that Abraham, after he had patiently endured all those years, he obtained that promise that God would give him a child. And here's what he goes on to say. The writer of the book of Hebrews says this, For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for a confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Abraham, I believe, is one of the favorite uh, characters 
in the Old Testament to this writer. He mentions him often in the book of uh, uh, Hebrews. Just like you and I might have our own favorite character in the Scripture, I believe the favorite character to which the writer of the book of Hebrews, if you were to say, hey, writer of the book of Hebrews, who which I think would be Paul, you might disagree, but uh, who's your favorite character? I think you can tell, you, can, he, you might be safe to say it's Abraham. And here the writer of Hebrews brings to mind that scene to which we're all familiar with from Sunday school. That scene of how the Lord encouraged Abraham to continue in his faith. If you remember, if you remember, Abraham was called out of the land of where? Ur. He was called out of that land by God. He was called out of, of what you might even say, uh, this land, a land of paganism, to follow after the Lord. And did he do it? He sure did. Did he get a whole lot of instruction? Not really. But he did it anyway. Believing what? That promise of the Lord. And that promise that God would bless him. And make of him what we know as the Abrahamic covenant a great nation. To which all the families, out of this, out of your seed, Abraham, I'm going to make a great nation to where all the families of the earth will be blessed. We find it in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. And he believed him. And so he leaves everything that, that's familiar to him. He leaves this land of uh, Ur of the Chaldees. And he leaves, picks up his entire family and moves where? I don't know. I'm just following where God tells me to. And when he struggled with God's fulfill fulfillment of that promise that was given to him many years ago, the Lord gave him insurance. The Lord gave him assurance. And what, what does the scripture tell us in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6? It says that he believed in the Lord. In what? It was counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham trusted in the promises of God and he patiently endured. And what happened? God delivered. Just like he said he would. But I tell you, in your life, God has given you promises. And he encourages you to patiently endure. Why? Because he will deliver. Was it not a long time before Isaac was born? So much to so that when, 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 when Sarah found out that, that it still was going to happen, what'd she do? She laughed. <laughs> yeah, you've been saying that for a while now, Abraham. We're pretty old, by, you know, we're pretty old, Abraham. I, mean, I don't know if you know how, how, the, how, the, how the body works, Abraham. I don't think it's going to work out. There was a gap between that promise and that fulfillment. And that's, that, 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 that gap between the promise and the fulfillment is what the writer had in mind when he was writing Hebrews, encouraging those Hebrew children. Those Hebrew believers, he was giving them that, that illustration that between the promise to which God had promised Abraham to the fulfillment of that promise, there was a gap and Abraham patiently endured. Look, there's a moment in your life here this morning that there's going to be a gap from the promise to which God has given to you and to which you will patiently endure. But God will come true on his word. Look, I will say this. If things appear slow with God... If things appear slow with God, it doesn't mean that he's forgotten you. And it for sure doesn't mean that he will not perform that which he has promised. I, will, I heard a pastor say this to me, to a congregation, and it's always stuck with me, and it probably wasn't original to him. But God is always working even when you don't see it. God is always working even when you don't see it. You don't believe me? Read the book of Esther. God's name is not mentioned there one time. But God, even though Mordecai didn't see it, even though Esther didn't see it, he was working. He was working. God is always working, even when we can't see it. I heard another preacher put it this way, don't doubt in the night what you saw in the light. So then the fulfillment of this promise happens. Isaac's born. You see that patient endurance to which he ran. 
But then you see an act of service. God told him to do the hardest thing imaginable. This one, this, this inheritance to which he patiently endured came to fruition in a son named Isaac. And God told him to do one of the hardest things imaginable, to offer that very son. You know how the story goes. To offer that son, Isaac, upon Mount Moriah. You see, Isaac was that immediate fulfillment of the promise. So what did Abraham do in this moment? Yet Abraham here believed that God, no matter what would happen, I, I, people, people have wondered what was going through Abraham's mind. People think that maybe Abraham was without a shadow of a doubt, knew that, that if, God, if he were to, to sacrifice his son Isaac based on the promises of God, why? Because the promises of God are always there. They will always come to be. That Abraham was sold that if God, if he took Isaac's life, that God would raise him from the dead. Why? To fulfill that promise. You can read about it in Genesis chapter 22. And it was after this testing of faith that the Lord confirmed through an oath. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 6. Again, verse 13 through 16. It was after this testing of faith with Abraham that the Lord confirmed through an oath that he would fulfill the promise given to him, recorded there. We'll read it again. For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing will... Uh, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Let me ask you this. Did God, if God said that he was going to do something, did he have to go through this exercise of swearing and giving an oath? Why did he do that? Why did he do that for Abraham? If God, God had already promised through the Abrahamic covenant that he would, he would make of him a great nation, and that through his seed, all the nations of, uh, would be blessed. He had the promise of God, but then God here takes an oath after, his, after Mount Moriah, after that experience, that exercising of faith on Mount, Mount Moriah. Why did God give an oath then? I believe it's to comfort Abraham. He already had his promise. But God reaffirmed that promise to Abraham by giving this oath. And so the writer of Hebrews is reminding these the struggling Christians, these struggling believers, as he's reminding Maranatha Baptist Church, anybody in attendance here today, reminding these struggling believers that Abraham, and I'm going to tell you, Abraham was living through much less light of revelation than we do today. Abraham continued on in faithfulness. Why? Because God is faithful to accomplish that which he has promised. He's encouraging these readers, keep going. Keep moving forward. There's going to be things in your life around every corner that are going to try to deter you, that are going to try to bring you down. Keep going. Keep going. We're encouraged in looking at these believers who struggled, as we do, yet persevered by the help of the Lord. He's trying to encourage these believers here to cling to the promise of God. Cling, hold, anchor. We're about to get to those words here just shortly. Cling to that hope to which God has promised to you. Cling to God's nature this morning. Cling to what he's already done in your life. Look, you've already trusted him with the greatest decision you're, that you'll ever make in your life. That is your eternal destination. You've trusted in God as your father who gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, entered into this world by a virgin mother, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for your sins, didn't stay dead, rose again. Look, you've trusted him and that exercise of faith for the greatest decision that you could ever make in your life, don't stop trusting in Him now. Cling to Him. 
Cling to that hope. Cling to God's nature. Cling to what He has already done. And unfortunately, the reason so many Christians struggle is because they don't know God outside that what they've received upon salvation. They've never really matured. They've never really grown. And so that's why they don't understand the full character of God because they've never grown. They've never lived the faith to which they've received. Can I encourage you this morning? Know God. Know God. How do you know Him? How do I grow? By being in His Word, serving Him, putting yourself under the teaching of God's Word, putting your faith in Him. Know and trust God today. Know and trust God is all power. He's omnipotent. He's all-knowing. He's, he's in all places. He's merciful. He's true. He's holy. He's gracious. He's all things good. He's our Father. Look, He's trying to encourage the believer. He's trying to encourage these Hebrews who are struggling with the same thing that you and I often struggle with. Keep going forward. Because the person of Jesus, the person of God, He is and will always fulfill His promise. We have a profound comfort in the person of God, but we'll continue. We have a profound comfort in the promise of God. That's what he's addressing here in verse 16. Go with me now, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 16. Hebrews 6, 16 through 18, it says, For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we, ha we might have a strong consolation. You might find encouragement in this, is what he's saying. Who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. Ah, I, I mentioned it just briefly. Why did God make an oath to Abraham as we've seen here? Why did God make that oath? It was certainly not due to the unreliability on God's part. That's not why God made an oath. Not because he was unreliable. Rather, the oath was due to the sinfulness of men. Philip Hughes makes these comments. He says that God should bind himself by an oath is a reflection not on the divine credibility, but on the perversion of the human situation. You see, Abraham had already gotten God's promise. That in itself should have been good enough. But we, we see that Abraham did not ask God to swear by you. You didn't, see, you didn't see Abraham saying, God, please make me a promise. You didn't see that, did you? Why did God do it? He did it to encourage Abraham. That's why. Abraham didn't seek for God to make me a promise. How many times have you been in, you know, in, in, in your own relationships when something goes wrong and you say, promise me you won't do this? And the other person says, I promise. That was not the situation here. Promise me you're not going to tell anybody. I promise. That's not the situation. Abraham didn't go to God and say, promise me again that oath that you gave. Abraham didn't do it. God gave it freely on his own will. Why? To bring comfort to Abraham. And I will say this, and the writer's trying to get this across in the book of Hebrews. Look, the strength of the oath is found in the character of the one offering it as well, uh, as well as the value upon the oath. Look, here's, the, here's an analogy that makes sense of this. If, if a habitual criminal makes an oath, would you really give it much credibility? If someone who, who is just a profound liar right? Says, I'm really serious this time. Believe me, would you give that very much credibility? Probably not. If he makes an oath on, uh, on a Bible and, and swears by something he maybe holds valuable. Now, if that person says, man, man, promise me this. And you say, I promise you. And that's all he does. But if he makes an oath, maybe how many times have you heard people in this world, and it's silly, we're actually, we're actually uh, told not to do it. But uh, let, the Bible says, let your yay be yay and your nay be nay. But how many times have you seen people take it? I, I, I swear on my grandmother's Bible. You've heard people say things like that. Why do they say that? Because 
when someone places it or swears on something that they hold value, uh, valuable, they're saying, if I were lying, then, then the Bible to which I swear on is a lie. If, if, if I say, I swear my grandmother's Bible, what they're saying is, if I'm lying, the Bible to which my grandmother owned is a lie too. That's, there's supposed to be some weight in what they're saying. Now, I don't know if you can take that today's society. I think uh, people have become uh, less uh, endearing to those types of things. But um, how many times I've heard people say this, I, I, I swear by my, my dead mother. What they're saying is, if I'm lying, then my deceased mother to which I'm swearing on is a liar as well. That's what the intention of that type of verbiage is. So by what did God swear? He swears by something greater. But nothing is greater than God. He swears by himself. God can go no higher than himself. That's why he uses this verbiage in his promise to Abraham. Nothing can come even remotely close to the exceeding value and preciousness of his own word. That's the earnestness to which God reveals to Abraham, look, you can trust me. That's the earnestness that we have this morning, that look, you can trust God. And find encouragement in that. In verse 18, verse 18, chapter 6, verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. To lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. The Lord worked on Abraham's behalf and gave him great encouragement to put his hope in the divine promise of God and keep going forward. And for you and I this, this morning, God has resolved to give you greater encouragement so that you might not give up. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Trust the promise of God. So we have the profound comfort of the person of God, the profound comfort of the promise of God. And then we see in verses 19 to 19 through 20, we have the profound comfort of the presence of God. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Which hope we ha have as an anchor. I love this. A lot of people quote this verse. Uh, which, which hope we have, referencing the hope that we found there in the verse 18, the, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He gives us three descriptions of that anchor, that anchor of hope. First, it is sure. First, it is sure. Here's the anchor of hope. Here's what he's saying. Look, don't give up. Have a, there's, a, there's an anchor of hope, and it resides in Jesus Christ. It rests on the other side of the veil in the presence of God. It is sure. This word implies that it is outwardly safe. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that can topple the believer's hope. Nothing can strip that hope away from you to this morning. It's sure. I remember I was, I was, um, I, I was in a houseboat. Uh, my aunt owns a houseboat on Lake Powell, and it's out there in Utah. Anybody ever been to Lake Powell? It's pretty awesome. It's, it's got a little bit more water in it now, but it, it, it was, it was, it's, it's been really low. But nonetheless, Lake Powell was awesome. We had a houseboat, and uh, what you, it's a huge, it's a dammed up river, uh, and, and it's just enormous. So with a houseboat, what would you do is you find a little cove out of the main thoroughfare to which boats and, and uh, stuff would go through. So you find a little cove, and you'd anchor your houseboat there. Now, I remember uh, when my uncle pulled this houseboat, it's huge. It had like six bedrooms on this houseboat. It was enormous. And so we were on, look, you got to like water because we were on this boat for two weeks, okay? So imagine two weeks 
on water. That's a long time to be on water. And so we anchored this boat in the cove. Now, they just didn't throw one little thing down. A six-bedroom bo- uh, you know, boat it is huge. They just didn't throw one little anchor down. No, they, they anchored this thing off, you know, they put it up on the shore off this big boulder over here. They put another uh, anchor uh, line over here around this boulder. They put the boat, you know, the anchor dropped below the boat. I mean, they had this thing secured. Look, a hurricane would have came through in the middle of the, it never would have. But, I mean, what I'm saying is it, st- I mean, nothing was going to move this boat. It was, it was sure. No matter what was going to come weather-wise, this boat was anchored off for sure. And that's the imagery that you have as a believer, that your anchor is sure it's not going anywhere in Jesus Christ. That's what he's getting across here, the writer. There is nothing that can topple your hope as a believer. Paul, that's why I believe Paul wrote this book. He had the same verbiage to the Romans. Romans chapter 38, verse, or chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What he's saying is nothing can topple the hope of the believer. It's as if the Apostle Paul here picked out every imaginable external force opponent and declared that nothing whether it be rain, whether it be weather, whether it be man, whatever it is, this, this external opponent could never separate them from the love of God. Why? Because we have an anchor that is sure, as the writer of the Hebrews puts it. No matter what you're going through in life, if you're struggling as a Christian, you're thinking about giving up, you're thinking about, look, I'm over this thing. God's given up on me, I'm going to give up on him. God hasn't given up on you. Your hope is sure. We're safe with that anchor of hope. I like this next way that it's described. We also find the anchor of the soul steadfast. You see, the anchor is sure. It implies that outwardly safe. No external forces can, can strip the love of God away from you. But the second thing we see in this verse, that we find the anchor of the soul is steadfast. It points to that inward stability. The inward stability of this anchor of hope. That it's firm within itself. What it's saying is there's no weakness. There's no weakness in hope as it's anchored in the soul. We don't have to concern ourselves with hope going bankrupt. We don't have to concern ourselves with our anchor having a scandal. It is steadfast. It's established firm. It's hooked in. And it's of the best materials ever. There's going to be no failure upon the anchor's part. It's steadfast. The third description of hope, the hope of the souls, it's demonstrated in the place to where the anchor rests. So it's sure. It's steadfast. Why? Why? Because of where it rests. Now, as I said, on our boat, we would tie off to a boulder over here, a boulder over there. They'd throw the anchor below. I mean, this thing was secured seven ways sideways. I mean, it was not going anywhere. Those anchor lines that we tied are only as good to that which we are anchoring it to. Right? If we anchor it to something that's, that's weak, that's not a very good anchor. Your anchor line might be great. The anchor itself might be secure, but that to which you're anchoring it to is of great importance. And that's what you see here. It's sure it's steadfast, but more importantly, what it's anchored to. It's anchored to Jesus Christ. That's the hope of the believer that can't be toppled. The place where the anchor rests. The anchor, we know, grabs onto the floor of the ocean. It holds that vessel securely. But the shifting sands of the world offer nothing to the security to secure us for eternity. Those shifting sands will try to move. So our anchor, it's a good illustration that the writer gives us here. 
But he, he tries to get across. Look, it's not like an anchor that goes over in the shifting sands below that try to get that, 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 that thing to move around. It's not like that. It's anchored in Jesus Christ. It's not going anywhere. That's what he's trying to get to the Hebrews. Our anchor does not go to the ocean below, but upward into the glories of heaven. For our anchor is, of hope is, and here's the illustration that the writer gives here, one which enters the veil. What was behind the veil? The presence of God. That was behind the veil in the Old Testament when the temple was set forth. Behind the veil was the presence of God. And that's where the writer is saying, look, your hope, your anchor isn't in something that's shifty. It's not in something weak. It's entered in behind the veil. What's behind the veil? The presence of God. That's where your anchor's at. What encouragement this morning to the readers. Behind the veil, that scene that the high priest could only enter into the Holy of Holies once a year to make sacrifice for the sins of Israel. And I can imagine that that priest, that high priest entered in. As he entered in, he trembled, knowing that he was going into the presence of the Lord. And he dared not fulfill his duties. Once his duty was done, he immediately turned and walked out through the veil. But that's not the case with our anchor of hope. It's firmly anchored in heaven on one end. And then it's firmly anchored to the believer's soul on the other end. Jesus is the one who went before us as the forerunner. In verse 20, that's what the writer's saying. He went out as a scout. That's what forerunner means. He went out as a scout. He went ahead of the troops. Jesus, as the forerunner, was one who was ahead of the troops, going before them. Christ, our Padramas, has gone ahead. And here he wants you to understand. Here's where we're going to wind down. Here's he wants you to understand. We will be where Christ is. That's what it means. We will be where Christ is. That's encouragement. That's encouragement. We'll be where Christ is within the veil. He's gone before us to prepare that place. I love John 14, verse 2 and 3. It says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. What is that a promise? That's a promise that he has. I will come again and receive you unto myself. And, and where I am, there ye may be also. Anybody ever heard of Michael Faraday? Does that remember? Name ring a bell from grade school. Michael Faraday was a great Christian, but uh, uh, along with being a great Christian, he was a great scientist. And when he lay dying, world-renowned scientist, when he lay dying, some journalists questioned him as to his speculations about life after death. Michael Faraday's response was, speculations? He said, I know nothing of speculations. I'm resting in what? Certainties. He said this, he said this, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and because he lives, I shall also. He stated this upon his deathbed. The director of a medical clinic told of a terminally ill young man who came in for his usual treatment. A new doctor on, uh, who was on duty said to him casually and cruelly, you know, don't you, that you won't live out the year. As the young man left, he stopped by the doctor's desk and wept. He said, that man took away my hope, he blurted out. I guess he did, replied the director. Maybe it's time to find a new one. And in writing about this situation, Lewis Meads wrote, Is there a hope when hope is taken away? Is there hope when the situation is hopeless? That, que that question, here's what he said, that question leads us to Christian hope. For in the Bible, hope is no longer a passion for the possible. It becomes a passion for the promise. Would you stand with me?
I don't know every situation. I look around the room and I'm familiar with most of you here in this room this morning. But I'd be lying if I said I know exactly what you're going through. Maybe you're here this morning you say, man, I need some hope. I need some encouragement. I'm facing a trial in my life to which I've never thought I'd experience. I'm facing things in my life that are really, really challenging me. Really, really, uh, if I'm honest, preacher, I'm, I'm, I, there's been some doubt. Can I encourage you like the, the writer encouraged the people? Look, there's hope. Don't, don't lose sight of the hope that's within. Don't lose sight of the promises that God has given to you. Don't lose sight. Think about who God is and what He has promised. And don't lose hope. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, but I, I, Preacher, I don't have that hope because I've never, I don't really know that I'm saved. I don't know that I have God as my Father. I've never trusted in Jesus to the way that you've described. I need hope. If you're here this morning, you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Maybe you've gone through the motions. Maybe you've, you've, you've taken it on from a religion's perspective, a religious perspective. I pray that, that if you've done that, then today you can say, I, I, I want that hope to which you've described. During this time of invitation, I pray that you'd come forward. Put your pride aside and come seek uh, come, come, come forward, I, I, and then what we'll do is we'll just take you to the side and, and show you how to have that hope that lies within, that's anchored beyond the veil in the presence of God. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this, this morning. I thank you for the challenge that we've read and heard. I thank you for the songs to which we've sang. Lord, I pray that this time would now be given to you, a time that the Holy Spirit would move upon your people, a time that we could reflect upon your word, Lord, and be challenged by it. Lord, I pray that if there's one struggling here this morning, Lord, I pray that they would rest uh, their soul uh, in, in, in you, Lord. I pray that they can be uh, know that it's sure and that it's steadfast and that it's not going anywhere, Lord, no matter how, how, how these external uh, foes may try, Lord, it, 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 nothing could separate us from you. Lord, I pray that we would continue on and press forward, being encouraged by this hope, this promise to which you've given to us. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You're here today and the Lord spoke to your heart. I pray that you respond. Every head bowed as the pianist plays. If you're here this morning, you say, man, I, preacher, I, I, I needed that. I, I I needed some encouragement and I found it, that God has not forgotten about me. He's not left me. I need to be reminded of that promise, that hope that He is, that He's given to us. A time to reflect and say, do I truly have that hope that lies within have I trusted in Jesus? Do I know that heaven is my home? That if something were to happen to me today, or if Christ should return today, do I know that heaven would be what, uh, that which awaits?
All right, well, thank you for coming out this morning. Thank you to our visitors. Thank you for coming out and joining us this morning. If you didn't get to meet our visitors, Patrick and Lydia back there, go ahead and, and get by and greet them. And I pray you come back tonight as we just continue our, our Sunday evening service, always rejoicing as we work through the book of Philippians. That'll be back here tonight at 6 o'clock. And so I pray that you have a good, uh, good afternoon. Whatever you find yourself doing, don't forget a couple sign-up sheets on the back table. Uh, one for camping, one for uh, the, the, the police, uh, you know, honoring our police officers that week. That's on the back table. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.